cord to the cloud. Okay. You're being recorded. Are you okay with that? That's fine. All right. So then we'll publish it if that's the case. Um, all right. So, you know, when, when it comes to breakfast and food stuff, to serve food or not to serve food at your special events and how that aligns with how many people can come into the to the event and how much lead time you need to close and determine this is how many people are coming and no last minute flush of people are going to be able to come in because we've decided mm -hmm. we're going to serve food. You know, like I said, I, I'd personally rather sleep in and have my morning routine. Uh, and so the two workarounds that I've gotten that have served me that have helped save costs um, you know, for venues, because like you say, the, the food piece tends to be the most expensive piece, uh, is one, to um, to uh, offer food in the goodie bags. So you mentioned before, like, we have a takeaway, so we do like a goodie bag. And so if I give them the goodie bags in the beginning rather than at the end, then in there I can have snacks and things along those lines. And Great. if I've done any sort, right? Yeah. And then if I've done any sort of planning, maybe I've even partnered with a company like Luna Bars is always very generous. You know, oftentimes company will happily ship you stuff to put in your goodie bags because, you know, you're promoting their brand while you're at it and also exactly. saving expense, right? Mm -hmm. So for me, the two most important things on offering, I, I think words we used were seminars, trainings, intensives, immersions, workshops, uh, is keeping my overhead low so that I can have my tuition be low. Uh -huh. And not everybody does it that way. So it's not a right or wrong. So like for the wedding planners that end up, you know, listening to this lesson, you know, this might not be their jam as much. But then you also talked about worry the the like food restrictions and what have you found in your experience of running like seminars and things like that when all of a sudden it's time to serve the food have you ever run into some of the people can't eat it and what do you do well um you know of course things have evolved over the years um and so you know going back i mean just, just maybe even further back but you know, going back some years, you know, um, people might have dietary restrictions and uh, hotels or other places were not as good as uh, good about accommodating them. But, you know, even now, so there, there's more accommodation. So that is definitely there. People are, you know, everything from vegetarian to vegan to, you know, avoiding nuts or um, avoiding, you know, um, dairy or, or um, you know, any other, any other type of food, allergy or intolerance uh, wise. So, you know, places are more accommodating. So that's a good thing. So you can uh, build that into your menu if you'd like. Um, but the other thing is, then that goes back to um, letting people uh, choose some of the things that they like to eat. Uh, because sometimes, again, it's just very challenging to, to, work with a hotel um, if someone has a lot of restrictions. Um, you have people who, you know, again, are maybe vegan um, and then people will be raw vegan. And so, um, you know, th there's all kinds of things in the hotel would have to do or the venue would have to do to accommodate them, which again, you get into letting people kind of choose or um, do their own uh, eating pattern, eating style where they'd like to do it or bring things with them. Um, so I think it's, it's, you know, again, if you, it, it's, it might be somewhat knowing your audience, um, again, depending on if you'd like to, um, at least, you know, serve, I'll say one meal a day or, or something like that. But, um, I think it's best to kind of leave it open or, or at least again, if you, if you feel like, um, value wise people feel like oh there there should be a meal included for this you know weekend um, um again take all those dietary restrictions or, or eating habits into consideration again working with the venue um and then maybe even take a um in your registration piece especially you know asking people if they have certain types of dietary restrictions um you know if you feel the need to you know serve some type of uh, dinner um, during your, your you know, day or, or weekend retreat or 
up because again, sometimes that can be good for doing other things, whether it's bonding or whether it's, you know, maybe you're doing some recognition or awards or something like that if you are gonna plan a, a meal, um, you know, at the event. So, but definitely, you know, in the registration piece, asking people their, their food preferences so that you can uh, get that established up front. You know, I think that you bring up a really great point there with the bonding, for example. Um, yeah, absolutely. Like breaking bread together. That's, that's such a big thing. That's such a big deal doing these things. And, um, you know, again, but then we've also talked about dietary restrictions and preferences and all these different things, all of which are completely valid, but make it really, really tough to add that food component into uh, venues. So what I do or what I've done in the past is I choose a venue that has choices. And so on the schedule, I will have like a set time that the, this is, this is meal time. We're going to have meal time for two hours. It's never rushed. And, um, you know, I build it in from the beginning, plenty of time for food. Right. Yep. But then it'll be choices. So you might find yourself here. You might find yourself there and so on. Uh, depending on what's right for you. So some examples will be like Star Rock, for example, because you know, that's an easy go-to if, if you have a little bit more um, desire to, to socialize and break bread with your group, then, you know, you could meet over at the lodge. If it's a beautiful sunny day, it turns out, you know, th there will be a group on the, um, on the balcony, on the terrace there overlooking. I think they call that a lover's leap. And then, um, you know, maybe just, who do I got in? No, go ahead. Yeah, I'm saying, yeah, yeah, lover's leap. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, right. And then, uh, you know, if you're just looking for some introspective time, which I often find is an introvert, I'm kind of drained. So I just want to go have my own lunch. And, you know, so I'll often just go to the sandwich shop. And while there, and I'll mention to the group while there, you know, they have like uh, coloring books and, um, you know, like meditation books and colored pencils. And I, I'm more likely just to go off by myself with my sandwich of whatever it is I wanted on that sandwich, you know, however mm -hmm. I wanted it served and take the time for introspection and just maybe just to, to break from, from the socializing. So, you know, different people want different things. And I think that that food piece, that putting together the catering piece, and I'm sorry to the caterers out there, um, <laughs> I'm costing money to right now, but I think that catering piece is what kind of fumbles it all up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Certainly from my experience, that's what it's been. And then, you know, if we offer some sort of food stuffs in our goodie bags and we give those out in the beginning, then we can put a check mark next to the goodie bag. If we have um, been dutiful in our planning processes and we've reached out to someone like Luna to get, you know, complimentary bars, then we also have had an opportunity to cross promote and, and um, I think generate some excitement about the event, you know, and again, whether this be a workshop or a retreat or a seminar or training, whatever it is, you know, put mm -hmm. those Luna bars in those goodie bags. I think it adds value, you know, and then it's just available for folks that should need it at any time which really goes in handy for, for people that meant well, but didn't have breakfast and aren't feeling so good, you know? Right. right. <laughs> yeah. And, and again, I, I'm with you with the, with the early morning. Um, you know, a lot of people would just, you know, like a little bit of, you know, rest and relaxation. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and even if they, even if they don't, they can still get up, uh, you know, and just have some coffee, tea, juice, water, what have you, and just kind of, you know, quietly start their day still. But, but yeah, I think um, definitely uh, at educational, you know, events, workshops, retreats, seminars, people can appreciate that, you know, early morning uh, quiet time without, without having, you know, planned breakfast per se. Mm -hmm. Well, I know I prefer it, but I also like to know that there's going to be things there and I have a choice because often I say, oh no, I'm going to go to Trader Joe's and I'm going to stock up. I'm going to have my, all my stuff. And then the reality is life comes in and sometimes it doesn't work out that way. Mm -hmm. So picking a venue for me, one of the number one things I do when selecting a venue is that piece of, do they have different choices for food stuff for people? Is it going to be easy for us to do this? And will people be able to do what's right for them, whether it be break bread together and socialize or get a sandwich to go off and do their own thing, you know, so that will dictate where I offer, where the venue is. 
and that that you know this uh, I would say about fifty percent of my um, enrollees are last minute are the last forty eight hours before the event. Mm. They're and making less the decision. Think, yeah, I mean it's, it's that's a lot just to say oh no I'm just going to have a deadline I'm just going to have a cutoff. And, you know, like I said, I've done other, other events for different industries along the way. And that's always kind of been the case is you have this large group of people that would love to go, but just can't commit until full screen for whatever reason, you know. Mm-hmm. And so for me, I think my venues and my uh, events have been much bigger uh, based on this. But now this greatly impacts pricing. So, in, which kind of leads me down the list, and I'll and I'll pull it up today. I don't know if you had a yet chance. No worries if you didn't. But um, I had I posted today about the lesson being, you know, coming up with a business plan, and mm-hmm. I posted the manual with the worksheet, it's like a four-page worksheet for any given event. You yes. You can refer yes. to this now. Did you have a chance to see that? Yeah. No, I haven't done it yet, but I see it. Mm-hmm. Okay, great. All right, so it's just um, a repeat of these. And essentially what happens is it's an assembly of workshops that equate to, you know, whatever it is, whether it's a, a, a weekend long seminar, like you say, or it's, you know, 200 hour yoga teacher training, or it's mm-hmm. a standalone workshop, you know, Friday night at the studio. Uh, and that's really how I do it. So that's what the whole 300 really is formed. Uh, so for reference material, we send you over to the 200-hour yoga teacher training because those lessons are listed there. But then it's 300 level. Now it's time for you to take your truths based on the information I've given you and, and others and then go through and create your own workshops. And so today I had someone ask me the question about how long I'll be offering my health coaching pricing. Mm. And I, yeah, and I think, you know, having – been in an industry, you know, if we have a firm deadline of registration will close two weeks before the event begins, then we have a number of components that we need to decide on and bring in. And I'm going to open this up and we're going to kind of chat about some of these things to help people navigate um, how to price their stuff, how to decide what gigs are right for them and what's not. Because oftentimes, you know, what I've seen happen with instructors over the years that has equated a dropout or, or giving up has been they heard about a venue or they were offered a spot to come teach yoga, maybe even early in their career. Mm-hmm. And they were excited about it at the moment just to get some experience, right? And then like here in Chicago, when the winter hit and all of a sudden commuting time was doubled or even tripled, right? Oftentimes, the instructors would find themselves not wanting to go anymore because, after all, there's only X number of students. And I really, I don't, I discourage that word only. Like, only what? Only one human came for your services today? So, (laughs) 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 only one human isn't enough? So, Mm. before you decide to run it, I think that there needs to be, like, some basic bones uh, met and put together. And so, I, for those of you that are are listening to this after the fact, you can look at this workshop thing that I'm, I'm talking to Lori here about um, in the post in Slack. And so, okay, so for the first thing I think is helpful to do is name the workshop. So if you go, like, what is the workshop this two-hour event going to be? If you go to the menu, there's examples there, and chakras is one. And so since Buffy just finished doing her chakra thing, uh, you know, that that's available for people fresh in the mind. You know, we might see more chakras workshops popping up or people that are excited about that and now want to do a workshop on nadis because it complements the chakras, you know? Mm-hmm. So in this way, I don't necessarily like set a set schedule for what's going to happen outside of lab lecture or practicum, you know? Uh, so anyway, so our workshop name, so coming up with our name, so we're going to call this workshop Chakras just because it's readily available and it's there and it's easy for folks. And then there's some different key points, and I'll, I'll read along with them. Um, we have syllabus section, yoga alliance category, purpose of workshop, workshop theme, workshop date, venue details, and they are location, what do you need to provide? What do you need to bring? Tuition and class minimum, class maximum, and then workshop description. 
Mm-hmm. So for for these pieces, there's a few reasons why why I asked my 300 hour folks to start organizing their information early on. Is that once you reach that level of experienced registered yoga teacher of 200 hours, you're eligible to sign up as a continuing education provider for Yoga Alliance. So it's handy to be able to pull out this workshop you created in training and offer that workshop later as CEC for for folks. So that's the idea behind it. So Mm -hmm. that in a year from now or two years from now or every month, whatever it is you do, you already know at the moment you created what category this this falls in. And so we all have different categories, but Yoga Alliance has their list. You can see them for that. That's not what the purpose of this chat is. You know, for me, I've categorized my lessons in lecture, which is me talking at you, and you could be muted the whole time and it wouldn't matter. Lab, where it's a little back and forth, which I would say, Lori, that's that's what you and I are experiencing at the time. You're giving me some information, I'm replying to Mm -hmm. it, and so on. Uh, And then practicum, where maybe you guys go out into breakout rooms and you practice, uh, or you are listening to the recording and you're putting together this workshop uh, my dog is stealing things we're at the studio and he's stealing things because he knows i'm on my zoom and he gets away with murder when he's when i'm on the zoom <laughs> so forgive forgive my breath and taste a puppy <laughs> moment all right um and so practicum would be you know filling out this this workshop template mm-hmm. and i think that that's the piece that often isn't done. And then when not done, my students graduate. Now circling back to the main idea, my students graduate and somebody offers, hey, do you want to come teach yoga at the country club, for example, right? And then and then I ask you how much you charge and what's your minimum number of people to go and what's the maximum mm-hmm. number of people to go, right? Mm-hmm. And so what often happens is people just grab the opportunity because they're excited about it in the moment and then find themselves driving in Chicago in February for a party of two for an underpriced tuition. Uh-huh. Yep. <laughs> right. Right. It, have you, have you seen that even like on the, um, the more formal side where people are excited and engaged on the onset. And then when they get in there for more, more months are flipping by, they start to lose zeal a little bit. Lori? Yeah. Yeah. I, I would agree because I think if you are, um going to do an event um someplace of course yoga related event i think you either have to um approach it from the standpoint that you're doing it you know um you know as a i mean you're doing it of course because you enjoy doing it but you know as a business plan business project or you know the complete other other side of that michelle is if you're going to do that you know two-person event in february uh, and there's a bad snowstorm the night before, <laughs> and yeah. nobody wants to <laughs> then you have to perhaps go in thinking of it as um, just something that you decided to do pro bono or for experience. And I guess that's okay if you decide that that's what you want to do and how you want to do it. But, you know, and if there's a place for that. But if you're yeah. doing it, for your, you know, um, building your business purposes, then uh, you definitely want to make sure that you're taking into consideration all the things you need to do for planning a good event. Otherwise, you'll wind up, like I said, kind of on the other side of the the point where I think you you'll feel like you're doing things kind of more pro bono um, on a volunteer basis. Mm-hmm. Well, and you bring up a good point. Like, when are we doing it? Just surely for the joy. I do quite a bit, just just because I want to. You know, um, I'm on this live just because I want to be there. There's already, there's a, there's a lesson plan in place. I don't actually have to be on the Zoom right now, but I enjoy it, right? And so because I enjoy what I do, it's easier for me to be there. And that's all fine and dandy and well. But at a certain point, life is going to be looking for me for things like rent and food, you know? <laughs> and, and so we can't just only do what we enjoy. We need to either A, have a different source of revenue, so that these things, it doesn't matter what you make. Or B, like you say, I think you threw out a couple of numbers for that, that uh, the profit margin 20, 30% or more, you know, mm-hmm. somewhere in there. I think it's helpful to have like a mathematical equation. Mm-hmm. 
right? Because these things turn out to be a lot more work than they look like. There's more work on the front end and the back end of anything than there is of any given event itself that I do. And so that's, that's a big piece. Everything from, you know, marketing to answering questions. I spent so many so much time answering the same questions again and again. So not having structures in place, you know, can, can definitely escalate how much time you're spending on that. You know, how much time you put together in your material. Is your material so long nobody looked at it and they just asked a bunch of questions instead? You know, and so that's a big piece of it. You know, for me personally is finding that sweet spot um, and what needs to be there. I've also had people brand new to the industry. They don't have a following. They don't have students. They're just getting going, and they want to charge forty or eighty dollars per head for a workshop. And you know, I, I often advise them that you know you may want to work towards that number. You know, mm -hmm. because I think there's also the matter of, and this is the way Edge does it. Does it is I'm I'm more inclined to get a bigger group and charge less, and that's just my jam like I don't I don't weigh my personal value on how much I am or am not getting on any one given event you know mm -hmm. I weigh my income potential off of a, you know an annual report of earnings yeah and maybe yeah. that's right maybe it's not right but it's what brings me joy and it's how I like to do it and I'm sure an accountant would say oh no 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 you need to you need to zoom in and see if prenatal is more profitable and therefore run prenatal but I don't really enjoy teaching prenatal so I only do it periodically you know yeah so there's that so figuring out like what your alignment with and we'll go over that list of um ideas and hopefully you can take notes you know as far as how it how it works for you to work through this process as well Nova um, winds at the bug, some giant mute bug hanging out on the other side of our window. <laughs> you apologize about the whining. Uh, all right, so let's do it, shall we? I'm going to take you off. Uh, okay, so we talked about the syllabus section, and this is just like organizing your ideas and thoughts. And in the manual, we, we pick chakras, and that is labeled as a P2. Anatomy mm -hmm. and physiology. And we're going to have a total of three hours on that. And so, on the 300 side, I would want every teacher to offer a workshop for that amount of time or be involved and assist one for that amount of time so that they then, then in turn could do it themselves. So, given the fact that you've already been running some, you've built the base, you've started, now you can pull out your nifty hand sheets from YTT and offer a chakra workshop. So like going back to that efficiency and processes to reduce the amount of lead time as you come into an event, it's so much easier to have structures in place and then just do your events whenever you want to or what have you. And then that way the minimum doesn't need to be as high to go, right? And the maximum mm -hmm. often depends on how much space we have. Um, and so the purpose of the workshop, I think, you know, you really, you really brought that up as far as what is your purpose? What are you trying to do? Are you building? Are you sharing? Is this pro bono? What is this? You know, why are you doing this? You know, knowing, knowing your personal why, not other people's why on your behalf, but your personal why is essential in this line, line of work. Um, and, you know, going back to that purpose that, you know, snowstorm hit the day before your workshop in February in Chicago and you've got two people enrolled and you know you charge you know $15 for them to come so you know it's an all-day event you know these kind of things mm -hmm. and then there's other other things that I think require consideration without judgment that might be you know do you have to pay a babysitter you know is the venue far enough that there's going to be gas or tolls or expenses on top of it you know did you spend $20 per person on the goodie bags did this event actually end up costing you money you know yeah. And, and yeah. one big, right, one big piece of this, and this can be just a simple workshop, you know, I've seen people spend so much money on workshops. And, you know, they have all the niceties and that's nice, but then they may not want to run it again, because after all, the whole thing costs them money and they, they've got other things that require their energy. And so I think it's okay to look as money as like an energy exchange, right? You know, mm -hmm. I'll provide a service and then you'll show up and you'll get something from it and that exchange might be expressed um, in the form of money or it might be expressed in my case with edge I do quite a bit of internship like hey help me build this thing or help me present this thing or bring your gifts and talents which I know Laura you have done you've brought your guests and talents and you've taught my people things and so it works you know that's just kind of how I do it 
Um, not everybody likes that model because you've got, there's a layer of giving up control on how it's going to look, mm, right? Because yeah. you don't really know, <laughs> right? Like, you don't really know. You don't know for sure, especially that first time with someone you've not worked with before, what that's going to look like. And so yeah. I think there's some grace that you need to need to build in. Um, okay, so anyway, back to our, our worksheet here. Uh, so then we have workshop date. And again, like have a pencil and erase this and put a new date in again, you know, and that way you can kind of repeat something you've done before. Mm -hmm. um, if it's more lab or practicum based and not just lecture based, you could redo the same exact workshop again and again and again. And every time you do it, it'd be a totally different experience. So we're experiencing that right now in this lab, Lori. Like, I don't think we've had this exact conversation before. Um, I think we've had conversations before about, like, um, you know, what kind of services you might be able to offer as a result of this training and what you might do and things like that, right? But now we're, now we're talking about something more funneled and more specific. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think that that's helpful. Um, I also think it allows for you students to keep coming back and hone their craft. Right, like go back in and revisit it. Let's open up to our workbooks here. Let's see where we left off on the last thing. How far did we get? Could we put this into practice? Could we add to it? Could we build on it? And so for me, I think the big piece, you know, is reminding folks that this, this isn't a romantic comedy and we're not coming for the wow factor that you get, say, the first 20, 30 hours that you're with Edge. But then from that point, it's like, all right, roll up your sleeves. We got work to do, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Which is certainly the harder part. What about it, remind me? What is the name of the workshop that you ran for our YT tiers a couple few months ago? Um, uh, diabetes, uh, yoga, and type two diabetes. Exactly. So that's certainly, I mean, people really, I got a number of messages after that one. Like, when is she going to do that again? I would like to do something like that, you know. And then I guess you get the human layer, too, where people start telling you their stories. Like, you know, I grew up and my mother had diabetes, and this is why I came to yoga, you know, and all, all these deeper, deeper things. And so mm -hmm. if you master the craft of, of, of the setting up the information, then you can spend more time on the other side. And that and that's really where I enjoy. Oh, you should see my studio. This little guy has just stolen absolutely everything he can while I'm on the Zoom. Uh, <laughs> he's got scarves, he's got masks, he's got all kinds of stuff. He's having a party here at Edgeoga School. <laughs> the difference between an audio and a video, right? <laughs> yeah, that, that's what they do, too, when you're not looking. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Well, he likes the attention. Um, okay, so here we are. All right, so then we went back to update and the idea of what, what we shared on workshop date was this can change. You don't have to make up a whole brand new one every time you have a workshop date. And that can really help what your minimum needs to be, and it can help drop your tuition, which can help grow your client base, mm -hmm. um, which is how I do it. Um, I did the math, and I don't know that I think we might have more students on this platform than certainly locally any studio has ever had um, ever right now in this moment. This is what people want to do in this season of life and making sure that you have the structures already created so that when season spike, because I didn't know this was coming, right? And next thing I know, I'm flooded with all these students. I already, I've been doing this forever. I have a ton of these workshop templates filled out. So it's easy for me just to jump on a call because I've done it a million times. So mm -hmm. I think that that's honed your skill. Do it again and again and again. You know, um, I once had someone say, no, I already did, already did chakras. You know, some folks might spend their whole life searching um, through that experience, you know, and revisiting it. And there's just so much that you can do with it. And I think ever being the student is really, uh, really key in this business. Um, so workshop change, you know, write that in pencil, not pen. And then uh, venue details, we talked about location. And I think I, I shared with you that my primary number one reason for choosing location will be, do they have different foodstuffs available if I offer long lunches of two hours so that people can break bread or get something or bring their own food, which I also, you know, hold space for, 
you know, is there a refrigerator in the room if it's a weekend thing? If there's not, I don't choose that as a venue. Have, have you ever been in charge or, or contributed to choosing the venue for the things that you've done, Lori? Has that ever been a piece that you have a little nugget that you can share on this call? Um, again, mostly kind of work-related, yes. Um, just thinking about a venue, again, might have been thinking about um, – the season, you know, um, not uh, necessarily hoping hosting an event here in Chicagoland, but then thinking, oh, it, this is going to be in January, uh, end of January, early February, and uh, we may want to host it someplace warmer where we're less likely to be uh, running into inclement weather. Um, plus, uh, sometimes in January, February, especially those who live in the Midwest or uh, places where there are snow and so forth. Um, they like going to someplace warmer for a little weekend, maybe getaway, that type of thing. So, um, bonus. <laughs> yeah. So that, that, that's always nice, especially in the early, in the early part of the year, you know, again, so I mean, it's something to think about. And then, you know, it's, a, it's going to be the same thing in the summer, although I have to tell people in the summer, especially, uh, late June, July, August, uh, doesn't pretty much matter where you go in the United States, usually it's going to be hot. <laughs> so Yeah, you, know, you got yeah. Ooh, we had a hot the, one in July one year. Oh my gosh, rain wasn't the concern. <laughs> yeah. You don't have to worry. But but again, sometimes like now, uh it's you know, we're getting to be fall. It's still very nice so here and uh but again some people may uh want it want to go someplace uh, where it's still a little bit warmer. Um, and then sometimes too, just choosing a venue where um, there are some other things for people to do, let's say, depending on what your event is. It might be other little excursions or something that they're able to do in the evening or uh, an afternoon excursion. Uh, maybe you're just doing your workshop or event for a half a day or so. And Maybe they want to do a wine tour. Maybe they want to do some other type of nature walk or whatever the case may be for venues that are, or, or other excursions that are available for them. Um, so that comes into play as well, you know, when you're kind of thinking about a venue, especially like I said, if it's a, you know, like two day event, two, three day event or two and a half day event or something like that. Because people right. like coming. Yeah, that Friday through, through yeah. Sunday. I like the Friday through Sunday. And I think the, yeah. the points you brought up are absolutely key. You know, and you can't please all of the people ever. So, you know, for that reason, I usually choose what I want. <laughs> That's what I do, you know, <laughs> because if I'm not pleasing everybody anyway, I'm going to do what I want. And so that location pieces are all really valid. And then based on that, what do you need provided and what do you need to bring? So that might even be the reason between offering a restorative cl class with props and a prop workshop in, in making, bringing those props to the venue really, really worth it. Where, you know, maybe we even sell props. So we have this whole prop based theme. You know, if, if not, then you might be at a, you might be a little better teaching a gentle flow standing class, you know, mm -hmm. because I'll tell you, you know, I, I've loaded up a Suburban full of everything out of the sun from, you know, from straps to, to blocks to my gong went, my singing bowl got dented, you know, all these different things that happen when you're moving stuff back and forth. And then meanwhile, there were classes at the studio where it was like, where'd all the props go? And so they went to our event, you know, and what that whole thing looks like. Um, so for me, I moved towards simplify, simplify, simplify. Here's yeah. a list of suggested things that you can either A, bring with, or B, will be for sale. And I usually am not even the person to sell them. Even those capital gains there, uh, I, I might tell somebody else, like, hey, if you want to sell blocks and, and props and stuff while you're there, you know, feel free to bring what you want. And mm -hmm. then based on that, you know, having a table out and you can go set up your table over there, make sure you have your square set up so you can take payment, I'm out, you know. Mm -hmm. And so that's. That's more my style, more my method, um, and it's certainly, you know, it, I could make more money if I spent more on that, but just for me energetically, you know, this is a question I wrote in the lesson today is, you know, what are you in alignment with? You know, I mean, I don't think I put those words, but essentially that's what the prompting questions were meant to ask and answer. What are you in alignment with? And how do you want that to be expressed? So for me, I'm in alignment with sharing yoga with as many humans as possible. 
and trying to provide a platform for them to build on something so they can continue doing it after graduation, you know. And so if there is monetary gain, then the truth is it's a lot easier to pay the babysitter or do whatever needs to be done so you can offer said services for the end goal of making the world a better place, which is the only thing I'm really up to over here. You know, that's what I'm trying for. Uh, Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it's helpful if that tuition number isn't so high that we have a minimal number of registrants, uh, but isn't so low that you run no matter what. So it's very rare. I I canceled Star of Iraq recently because I was exposed to COVID. Luckily for me, I didn't end up with COVID, but I was exposed. Mm -hmm. And I felt like the responsible thing to do was to reschedule the retreat, you know, for like a week. But by then, you know, it just didn't, it didn't go. Uh, But that's pretty much how I plan on handling that. Uh, So in that way, then your class minimum, so kind of going back to pricing, we're going to stay on the sheet, class minimum, maximum tuition, workshop description, I feel, you know, we can pull from lessons or lectures or, you know, Buffy had her, um, her content that she shared with the, with the chakras, you guys can go see that for this time here, but the tuition, the class minimum and the maximum is really what I want to focus in on. Cause I think it's the hard part for people. I have so many students say, Oh my God, I want to do a workshop on this and this and I'll do that. And they get all excited. And at the end, it doesn't oftentimes happen. And so my, my goal in life is to be that bridge between, I would love to do that. And Oh, I did that, you know? Mm-hmm. And so here's the questions, and I and I love the way you process and, and uh, verbalize data. So let's see if we can play around with our questions, and and see what this conversation brings us. Um, all right. So someone called me today or emailed me today asking, you know, about my health coaching program, and she sees that I run sales, and how long will the sale be going on? Right. Which I don't know the answer to that question ever. So I'll just reveal my hand now. Um, but these are the factors that help me determine that. Right. So based on everything we've talked about, the minimums, the maximums, the prep time, all that goes into all of these things, the tuition, how much you're going to charge, overpricing, underpricing these things. Right. Uh, mm-hmm. These are the factors that I use that's on the list from our Slack. And I'll end up dropping this recording in after this lesson for folks to listen that aren't aren't here live listening in. Um, OK, so one is have I met the minimum of students to enroll to run the program? First things first. First thing I do is run a sale or a special or a bundle. Um, sometimes I'll even like have like if you get the 200, then you can have kids yoga for free or whatever, you know, whatever it is. Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. that's to help me establish my minimum of humans. It's not yet even part of a, how much am I going to make, you know, profit margins mm-hmm. yet. Mm-hmm. And can I assemble a group that are interested in exploring this topic so that I can effectively run my lab and practicum pace, right? Yeah, so that early incentive so that you will go ahead and, um, how should I say, get people to, uh, those who are definitely interested to, to go ahead and react and commit. Because uh, like we were saying yeah. earlier, um, you know, some people, uh, for whatever reason, will have to wait and, and think about it or commit later. But, you know, sometimes if you put that early incentive out there, some people will say, oh, this is great. I'm there. And they go ahead and register. And like you said, that helps you to establish that. Right. That minimum that you need. Mm-hmm. So those early incentives. And that's, a yeah. float, and that's the float the balloon tactic, too, that I'll float the balloon. Do people even want this? You know, if they don't want it at this price point, they certainly don't want it as the price begins to rise. And it does. Uh, And then the next question is, am I near the maximum of closing this program? So this is yet another opportunity where you can roll the dice, kind of like, you know, a flight. You can roll the dice. You can show up at the airport the day of training. You know, that will take you if I'm not full. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right? And, And you can get the best right. I don't, I think even even better rate than the early bird rate is that I still have one spot for a yoga mat to go, or I have one goodie bag left, which I often end up giving to charity, to be honest with you, but not always depending. Um, Or, you know, that one person that just couldn't pull it off any other way ran the risk of not being able to attend at all because it might've been sold out. And I, and I do turn people away for things. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm not running that program anymore. I only ran it you know, that one year or whatever, you know, it's gone. The opportunity is gone uh, in the price point. Then again, on the, on the backside, it's likely to drop. 
So for me, there's the, I do like this curve method where the least expensive time to join my program would be in the beginning or the end. And sometimes folks get upset about that, which is actually one of the reasons why I decided to address this is that, well, no, early bird, you know, everybody knows that. And I'm like, no, not everybody doesn't know that because that's not what I'm in alignment with. What I'm in alignment with is one, meeting a minimum number of students so that the actual training itself can be the best possible experience I can offer. And I need people in the room to do it. Like, like I needed you to show up on this call for this training and this Zoom to then be recorded and shared, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. If we had 30 people show up today, I would have muted everybody else, and I still would have talked only to you um, b- because you're in the 300 hour and you're moving towards the end of the 300 hour. This is something that I want to make sure you get before you're done. But I might be accepting like chat or something from folks or so on. As it turns out, it's one of the last nice days in Chicago, and I didn't expect to have a ton of line attendance, so I figured I'd make a recording of some sort and post it. So here we are. <laughs> Right? The weather often dictates these things. Uh, All right, so that's the minimum and the maximum one. All right, the next one. Um, Is this what people want, or has society shifted towards a different need, i.e., kids yoga was not on my radar in 2019, but it's highlighted in 2020? So it's huge for me. Like, I did not, if you told me a year ago, because I think I met you almost a year ago or it or around that. If you told me when, when I saw you here at the studio that I'd be running kids yoga teacher training, I would have mm. said no. <laughs> no <I'm not. laughs> that's, that's not even on the radar of things I plan on doing in 2020. I had actually really planned on focusing on my Ayurveda program that I've been working on for over a year, you know, that's kind of, and more nutrition. I think we even talked about that, like Mm -hmm. nutrition and dietitian and and starting to bring the science in for some of these, you know, old teachings and kind of creating a bridge and ideas. I I, I recall we talked about that day, you know, at the studio. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Which we're doing and is there, um, but my attention is divided between the kids and they are beta and I kind of go back and forth, you know, and I have other things coming in that, you know, are already there or created or don't need much to get done or someone else wants to do. They're spearheading that maybe a 300 hour teacher that's spear, spearheading some project. Like Buffy's got a whole plan that she's working on. And I'm just sharing her links. It's really nice. And it allows me to do this other thing I'm doing over here. And mm-hmm. so for me though, I mean, I just feel like it, as much as I don't see myself teaching a kid yoga class, as a teacher, like what a service to give right now, you know? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, which, I'm worried uh, about these stressed out little kids. Yeah, it just, um, and, and just listening to you, I mean, it's like other things, especially with, with COVID right now, but even, you know, if it wasn't COVID, it could be something else. It could be, I don't know, it could be economy related, it could be even something going on. It doesn't have to be national wise, it could be something going on regionally or locally. Um, you know, that, yeah. that on to, I mean, we have all these areas that get um, hit with hurricanes and wildfires and, and all kinds of things. So, um, but I think what, um, what's important is like you said, you know, especially if you're, uh, you may have decided that you had a series of events and themed out, but to be flexible so that you can pivot and, um, you know, go ahead and, and, still be able to run your business, but meet the demands of, you know, your community or your region or, you know, on a national level, if you, you know, choose to do it that way. But it's that, yeah. that flexible so that you can, you can pivot. I mean, there were people that I've, I've seen stories in the news, especially now, you know, related to COVID, maybe someone started a business and they were making, you know, um, some clothing item. Well, now with COVID, uh, maybe that clothing item is still a little bit in demand, but we all know initially that masks were very much so in demand once CDC decided that that was, you know, the route that everybody needed to go. And so many businesses, you know, quickly uh, pivoted or they just kind of, you know, incrementally leveraged what they were already doing to start making masks. And I think with the, um, you know, with your yoga workshops and, and trainings, you have to kind of do the same. Like I said, you could be responding to something um, locally in your region, you know, as well. Oh, 
Good point. Good point. Because I don't know about you, but I've been wearing things that look a whole lot of like sweatpants uh, for a while now, <laughs> you know, and I wonder like even like how is the lip gloss industry doing, you know, like I think about these things. These are things that I think I about. I said that to, to people, Michelle, I have said to more than one person, boy, how is the lipstick industry doing that whole industry? Because, you know, you <laughs> yeah. Got- frustrated with putting the mask on it's like gee you know and in, in early on you know I'd be putting a little something on and then I say well this is I don't know Lord, this is just going to wind up all in the masks <laughs> so what, what yeah it's going to create a bigger <laughs> mess yeah I went and I stopped and I got some of that Burt's Bees <laughs> real light pink just so I had something because I'm on zoom I want something you know right. <laughs> right. let's get dry yeah, that's really, really, really great point. And, you know, I think that um, uh, helping people understand, you know, that piece of most of these answers fall in the yamas and yamas in the unattachment piece. You know, if you're not attached to what the outcome looks like, you're more readily able to pivot. You're more ready to have the clarity of mind required mm-hmm. to pivot mm-hmm. versus, say, you know, panic or disengage, which oftentimes happens. I've had people say, oh, no, we had to close because of COVID. I'm like, are you sure you had to close because of COVID or did you have to pivot? You didn't do it, you know? Mm-hmm. So that mm-hmm. happens. Um, and not, not from a place of judgment, but from a place of growth and personal accountability. Yeah. Uh, so, okay, so let's take a look at the next one. How much bandwidth does this program require? All right, so I think, I, I think I've usually beat up on prenatal yoga pretty good. So we'll use that as the example. The amount of bandwidth that the prenatal yoga teacher training costs me is so high that I have to cancel everything else and only do this one thing. Mm. And the tuition reflects that. But at the same time, I also feel like, you know, when picking tuition for things, I also feel like it's such a needed service that while I will not run it year round, based on the simple bandwidth, oftentimes there's a single individual that carries the entire group. And that person gets special VIP treatment. Like they might get to be part of um, behind the scenes planning. Um, They might get to um, pick the schedule. You know, at one point I had a gal, she paid me $1,500 to run the prenatal yoga teacher training. So I met my minimum to do it. Mm-hmm. And um, she got to pick the schedule, though. So it was whatever she needed the schedule to be from one week to the next. That was the tuition that was paid for that. And then everybody else, because I, I want more prenatal yoga teachers in the community, although I don't necessarily want to be the one to do it. You know, I think I dropped the tuition to like 249 I mean, it was ridiculously low. It was so low. And it was meant to, to be available to people that otherwise wouldn't be able to take this training that would want to serve this audience. And so in that time, you know, I reached out to a number of like the, um, the, um, what do they call them? The home birth um, assistants. They've got a name, not so much midwives, but people that are of that industry, you know, Um, and and able to give them that training and they were able to partake and be part of that training because I had already picked up my tuition from the first person. Her, her primary concern wasn't the credit card. It was the time. And so that's the big piece of it. Are you talking about people that do Lamaze training? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Yeah. And you know, they, they, they might, they might, help with home births and things along those lines yeah Yeah. and that's yeah and so you know this can be a a a meek earning this career you know so oftentimes Mm -hmm. these are the people that could serve our community the most with yoga teacher training prenatal um but it's just so incredibly expensive that it, it never gets taken and so that would be like an example of how i go about you know doing it because it it aligns with, okay, this is going to be my minimum. And also it's going to align with what, why I open my school, why I offer prenatal yoga teacher training at all, you know? Um, And so I think answering your own questions to any given event or specific thing you're trying to do, you know, some people are like, I'm not really looking to make money on retreats, but I want to be able to travel the world for free. You know, or, or not for free, because Lord knows it's, it's not free. Uh, but I want to be able to travel the world and have this funded. 
you yeah, know, and then other mm-hmm. folks are like, I'm going to have to take time off my full-time job or give up my two weeks vacation for this experience. And I absolutely want it to be profit margin. And that's still fine. You know what I mean? There isn't, there isn't mm-hmm. a right or wrong. And so I think the only wrong is judging the way somebody else wants to do it. You know, that, that's the only wrong I get out of that. Okay. So the puppy has graduated to eating the dirt from the plant. <laughs> All right. <laughs> for the for the comic side of, of these live journeys, I should not have brought him over to the studio. He's just been all all pent up. All right. Um okay, so how much bandwidth does the program take? So that would be the same thing like your workshop. If this is a workshop you could show up and do with little to no research, then maybe have your tuition reflect that and the ones that are more label intensive, then charge more for those once you've established a base. It, you know, which I'm sure yoga for diabetes, you know, that based on your lesson plan that day, that that took some work to put together. You know, I don't think that that shoe, shoe from the hip data, unless you really know in your bones, you know, <laughs> so that was pretty detail oriented as far as I recall. Right. Yeah. Uh, and then to two, again, it's like, and you were saying earlier, you're doing a workshop for, um, you know, for more, um, uh, uh, how should I say, classes or volume. But um, the more specialized, you know, just like you're saying, for the prenatal, the more specialized what you're offering or doing is, you know, um, you, you need to take that into consideration for your, for your costs as well. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, the more specialized means less people, that means higher, higher tuition. Um, okay, so, or higher energy exchange on another level. I mean, I've given yoga teacher training to people to come clean the yoga studio once a week. You know, I mean, whatever energy exchange you come up with, although in my experience, as much as I love to barter, it can get tricky. Mm-hmm. Uh, all right, so have I finished writing this program and is it passive income at this point? So I think we just touched on it in your example in that you've done the work for yoga diabetes and if you don't greatly vary it, you could run it again and you've already done the work. So it's kind of more of a passive income experience Mm -hmm. and that you are showing up for the training. You're getting your hour there, uh, but you're not starting from goose egg, you know? Right. So I think that that's a big piece. Like, do you see yourself like just personally for your own personal goals? Do you see yourself running that same workshop for different people that might come in different audiences or different venues or do you see yourself building on what you introduced into like a serious kind of thing like where would you want to see yoga from diabetes goes because I mean that could be a whole career just by itself just that one little thing mm-hmm. um, a couple of things I would say building on the yoga for diabetes um, you know when I did it of course it was for teachers and teacher training um, yeah, and I also see taking it and um, just say just you know, maybe shifting it a little bit and uh, making it more of a um, yoga for diabetes for the more the um, consumer. Um, right. Just, yeah. That would An be. actual class. Here's mm-hmm. here's the class. Here's twenty classes mm-hmm. that are appropriate. Yeah. And and that's that's interesting too because. Not everybody wants to work from the idea behind the theory or the why of things. Some people just want the class plan designed for them and know that, you know, as long as I understand these key principal things, I'm here to teach class. And that mm-hmm. that's okay. That's a service needed. I need people who offer that service for me. Right. And so that, right. that's good. And so that might be something that you could work on. Um, okay. So let's see. What's our next one? We're almost wrapped up here. Uh is there a mentorship piece to this program that will prevent me from offering mentorships for another program? So this is huge for me. This has been my biggest obstacle with yoga Alliance, um, giving short-term expense extensions at six weeks a pop. Mm. I've had no idea, you know, even three months out what we would or would not be allowed to do in three months out. And, yeah. you know, education isn't really, set up that way education is is set up to know what you're going to be doing next school year you know mm-hmm. and, and edge is no exception uh so for me now that i know that your alliance is allowing online virtual distance learning through 2021 i know that my health coaching program which is kind of you know what i'm zeroing in on and we talked about you know over a year ago that best would be this year is getting health coaches together to offer these services that we've talked about Right, but making sure that they've been trained not only at the 200 level, but also at the 300 level. 
and yeah. um, that, that's been done or that's included, that's part of it. Before we get into this more specialized learning piece, I think it's the word you use that specialized. Uh, okay, so the mentorship piece is the health coaching is so much more time consuming than some of the other programs that I might run, but I love it and it's part of my bigger cause and I'm in alignment with it, but it will prevent me from taking on, like I wouldn't, I wouldn't publish prenatal right now unless I had 10 or 20 people randomly come to me saying, you know, we've all banded together, put our pennies together, committed to being there, you know, and even then I would only do it as a short program because I'm, I'm zoomed in on this Ayurveda thing. I'm zoomed in on the uh, boosting the immune system. I'm zoomed in on people understanding nutrition and being motivated to make, you know, healthier choices and things like that. And that's just where my heart is right now. Uh, which leads into the next question is, is it a short program, a long program? If it is a long program, will prevent me from running a new program alongside it? Which is that same kind of thing. So, Lauren, if you wanted to take this weekend and write up a bunch of class plans that you found appropriate for yoga with diabetes, provided their doctor signed off on it and all the legalese was handled and taken care of, you know, you could do that. I would consider that a short program, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't consider that something that you're still going to be here six months from now, you know, and then also factoring the people not only that are there, but the people that have wanted to jump in like midstream, which is always more work. Um, and, and also the people that have dropped out, you're still there, you know, you're still there. And so that, that's, that's a deciding factor, short, short programs, long programs. I do kind of tend to like, um, short programs strung together is modules that equate to a long program. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Have, have you run anything like that? And if so, what's your, what's your experience been? Um, well, just kind of going back to what we were saying earlier, like um, talking about the diabetes one. Um, with diabetes, other people, people with diabetes tend to have other uh, comorbidities that go along with that, that mm -hmm. would kind of themselves well. So you have people with diabetes who, uh, type 2 diabetes, uh, um, sometimes tend to uh, need to lose weight. Um, or um, people with diabetes are also at higher risk for uh, heart disease. And so um, just, you know, taking those three topics, uh, yoga for type 2 diabetes, yoga for weight loss, and yoga for, you know, um, uh, stress or that type of thing, uh, stress management or, or something, something along that lines, you could run that as like a three-part um, training or series, both on the teacher side and the consumer side. But you would start off with building each one of those topics, and you could offer them a la carte or uh, group them together. And so that's, uh, that's another concept and ideal that, that, uh, that I'd like to do. Well, you know, it's my favorite way of doing it. Because oftentimes people come and they say, when are you going to start this again? When's the start date? You know, and for me, the start date is whenever you jump in. That's the start date. That's really served me. Um, it, costs, it costs more work, you know, on the other side of things. It does. Than just like I've got my group ready. I've got my goodie bags done. We're going to run this and we're not going to do this again for a year or eight months or whatever. But the modular piece, I think, is a, a best service to people. In that if you if you say yoga for diabetes is where it's at for me and I love yoga for diabetes and that's what I want to do, then, you know, break it up in quarters and skip over the holidays because nothing much happens December or so. Mm -hmm. Everything kind of picks mm -hmm. up first week of January. So this is really where the cohort model started to form, I think, on its own volition, is that people wanted to start an end date. I mean, they can come in at any time, but just having a start and end date helps me navigate the waters and the seasons of um, of what we're up to. So if you did that, then then people could jump in. In this case, because it is so specific, this information you're giving, you could say, well, my next module starts on this date, but we do this every year, year round, and it just keeps going. Mm -hmm. And depending on the season of the life or what else might be happening or what other things have your interest, you know, would, would denote, you know, the tuition and, and the details and all of that other kind of stuff. So this is what I know for today, for the October for December cohort, for the October for December cohort, 
will in all probability be my all-time least expensive most offerings ever because I'm creating a bunch of programs so the value will be so dense and people will be more interactive it'll be more one-on-one coaching like you're getting on this call right now you know Mm -hmm. for Mm -hmm. the least amount of price because what I've asked you to do is start a program in October which I know you've been in it but I've asked asked people to start October 1st and Mm -hmm. see me through winter Thanksgiving holidays vacation time you know and we've talked about you know people then aren't really tuned in again until January 7th well they needed to be done by then because Yoga Alliance had told me that we only have until the end of 2020 and then they'll let us know what's next so (laughs) thankfully they finally shifted away from that but you know so so that was it was like for like 299 you could take yoga teacher training but you had to take it as an immersion you had to come to absolutely everything. You have to train every single solitary day. There's no flexible schedule, and you need to be wrapped up by December 31st because that's what my governing body told me needs to be done to stay in compliance with you. Mm-hmm. And so, like, sometimes there's these other factors that if we don't include them or if we don't think them out, we might find, find ourselves like, oh, well, I didn't have permission from Yoga Alliance to run an online training in January. Like, now what am I going to do? You know, it's a different thing. It's a different experience. So timing is huge. Um, I would not really recommend anything where people have to do a lot in October through December, um, but rather be more like, you know, this is going to be lab-based where you come, we're going to do – uh, re- restorative yoga, air, yoga for diabetes, and it will be more chills then. It's actually a reason to come to yoga because there's so much going on in November and December. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. In yeah. many cultures. In many yeah. cultures. Yeah. Uh, so there, so that's what, yeah, November and December tends to be ripe with that. You know, in August, they want the more rigorous uh, vinyasa flows and things like that. So you need to consider what's going on in the world around you when you decide what your offerings are going to be, if they're going to be successful. Um, generally. All right. Um, will it be the best use of energy for my student body? So I think I kind of touched on that, um, just threaded throughout this conversation. Like, honestly, mm-hmm. like right now, I think I can best serve my student body by giving them small modules of time because nobody really knows what long term looks like right now, where they can reach benchmarks and goals along the way. And my two key things are kids and immune system, you know. Mm-hmm. So, but, but getting to that why took years and it changes, right? It right. wasn't kids and immune system in 2019. <laughs> you know, that's not what it was last year. So I would love to see you keep up with the yoga for diabetes. I don't think that's going anywhere. And I do think that there's um, been a number of folks that have had a sedentary lifestyle as a result of all that is now. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, you know, sadly, that often does lead to other things, you know, that then need, well, to, need to be. See, you're, 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 you're saying something there, Michelle, because, again, with, with COVID, um, you know, there's, there's a couple things going on, at least health-wise. Well, there's lots of things, but a couple things come to mind, um, you know, again, people sometimes being home and, and not being active as much, you know, people... Um, have issues with weight gain and so forth. And then I just heard, I don't know who did the research or study the other day. It was Thursday or Friday in the news they were reporting. Someone had done a survey and said something like 18 to 24 year olds were expressing more uh, kind of depression and anxiety. It was up like by 25% in the survey that someone had done, um, which yeah. then, you know, you can see how you could run some programs and things related to that because, you know, that's, that's what the data is showing. So again, those are courses that you could be thinking about for early next year uh, because again, you've got people getting weight issues and, and other things going on because of COVID and more depression, anxiety related things. So you could run some classes related to that as well because again, that's kind of responding to what's going on, you know, in the world. Well said, Lori. And I will tell you, like, right now what I'm doing is, you know, I'm opening up my net to include people that specialize in such things, you know, to have counselors not only available, uh, but but involved in 
you know, different programs and offerings along with people that offer, you know, dietary counseling and are licensed and trained to do so and things along these lines. I think it's so important to know what's happening in right now. And I think it's also important to know that you don't need to do and know everything yourself because that would be out of my scope of practice anyway, you know. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. did I did I take the time to build those relationships so I have them at the ready? Because, yes, we can have a guest speaker come in frequently <laughs> to address this very real, real, real topic. And, you know, I know that when I was having a, a chit-chat with one of my friends, and she's a psychiatrist, and she said, the biggest problem I see is doctors tell these students to go to yoga. But then we're limited by our scope of practice, but so tempted and want to help where, you know, it can be, it can create a perfect storm. So mm-hmm. I think by having a network, it, it's just so essential to have a network, a, a referral-based system, and, and, and people locally that you work closely with and know and can, can say, oh, you know, I know this person very well. This is who I would see, you know, and have that and have more more than one available for, for your base. That's just so, so relevant. Such a great point, Larry. Thank you for bringing it up. Uh, okay, I think we only have one or two more, and then, and then we're going to wrap this. Um, let's see. Are you running this program for the purpose of training future leaders for this program? Absolutely. This is why I'm running the health coaching program. I'm running it because I would like to train health coaches. Because this isn't, again, I think I've expressed it in the past that, I mean, I want to work in wellness. It wouldn't have taken much more education for me to move to like physical therapy or rehab or anything, you know, along those lines with, Mm -hmm. you know, all the benefits like a 401k and insurance and stuff, you know. Um, But I personally, I really want to work in wellness. That's, that's, that's where I thrive. That's where I feel happy. So I'd rather train others that, that come in and maybe, you know, maybe they're already a, a counselor or a school counselor or a sociologist or psychologist. They have these credentials already. And then all I need to, to do is help thread in the yoga piece. And then, th- then they are qualified to uh, remain in their scope of practice for what they're trying to do. So, yeah, that's for sure what I'm up to. If anybody was wondering, that's what I'm doing. Uh, all right. What does, okay, does the world need some good news right now? If so, I run a sale. Yes. Sometimes <laughs> a sale is is nothing other than I saw the news and was so disheartened that I thought, well, maybe I can get some people in yoga teacher training and give them something to do while we deal with this, you know? And so I think that that's okay too. And I think yoga teachers do this a lot. So when things, you know, like I, I'll use an older example that was on our mind for a while, you know, the school shootings was what everybody was talking about. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I will tell you, it was just lovely to see the yoga community step up and how many workshops I started seeing pop up all over the place. Some respecting scope of practice, others not. But, you know, the heart there was so lovely. You know, does the world need your service? And sometimes that does mean it's going to have to be a pro bono because you have a service that's needed so direly that, you know, you can make it donation based or whatever. But, you know, if we circle back to our original idea, kind of tying this up in a neat little bowl for you, if you've built some relationships on sponsorship with like Luna bars and ambassadorships and things like that, you might see your income stream is a annual picture. And I think we talked about this even before the recording. Your income stream is an annual picture, not an individual event picture. But also you're keeping track of the patterns and the flow of things and so on, making sure that energy exchange is, is right with the world. You know, so that's that's a really, really big one, I think. Um, and why it kind of really does all in, influence and tie in together. Uh, let me see. Okay. So then I just sum it up. I write based on the outcome of each factor along with the requirements of my governing bodies. I set a price. Mm -hmm. I hope this helps you decide what's right for you. So, and this is why I don't even, um, I don't even really know what my uh, competitors are charging. I have no idea what the people down the street are charging. I only know that maybe if a student say, well, so-and-so is charging this or that, you know, Mm-hmm. And usually, you know, okay, you know, that just doesn't really have much to do with my pricing structure. If absolutely everybody in the world is charging under $500 for the 200-hour yoga teacher training, which is currently the case, then, mm-hmm. yeah, I need to meet that or I need to add value. And that's what I think this whole conversation we've talked about um, has led up to to that big, 
that big answer and that you're not defined by how much your value isn't defined by how much you made today. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I do, I want to throw that in cause that's trendy. It's like, Oh, never offer a service for less than you're worth. You're giving up your value and your worth. And I will say that I think that's an over oversimplified idea and it's, it's not one that I subscribe to myself, you know, personally. Yeah, no, you have to charge for your services that, you know, you, you have yeah. to charge. Mm-hmm. All right. Anything else you can think to add to this little nugget before we wrap it up? No, this this has been good. I mean, again, it's an important topic, um, you know, to, to think about uh, planning, think about all the planning, and then think about um, how to bring that all together, you know, to come to your yeah. to your cost. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Exactly. All right. Well, with that, I'm going to go ahead and let you go. And uh, for you and everybody else, pull out your worksheet now. Um, even if you're not in the 300, I, I posted that so that everybody had access to it. And um, it's, it's not that fancy. It's four pages long. You'll see the last page is create a class. I highly recommend you just create a class that you created along the way in yoga teacher training. Right. Again, like repurposing our work now mm-hmm. would not necessarily be the time to to bring up a whole brand new sequence because oftentimes that equates to people never reach the finish line. So use a class that you already know, put that there. You know, I think I'm the 200 hour of always saying, learn one class that you could teach blind, you know, in the dark, in a brand new venue, you know, when everything went opposite of what you thought it might, might be, teach that one class. So that would be a, a nice class to teach there and then change it up to based on your audience and so on. So Lori, thank you so much for joining me today. It was lovely chit-chatting with you and it's been a, a great value, I'm sure, to all that will listen to this recording and, and learn from you and you know, see the other side of things that you know, someone who's kind of been in the industry a little longer know about. So it was lovely, until next time. All right, Michelle. Namaste, Lori. All right, you and Nova, enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you. Hey, and shoot us a message on when you're going to do the next yoga for uh, diabetes. I'm sure everyone that will listen to this will be wanting to know. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. Okay. okay. Bye-bye.